At first glance, the effects of electric fields and magnetic fields appear to be very very similar. They apply forces without objects having to touch each other, they both attract and repel, and we've actually observed both for much of recorded history, all the way since ancient times. In fact, for most of history, we've assumed that they were really the same thing, and it wasn't until about the 1500s that we were able to distinguish that no, the electric force and the magnetic force were actually two separate phenomena. But they were so similar that scientists were pretty well convinced that there was a good chance they were still connected in some way. And that was actually established in the early 1800s, when we were able to observe magnetic fields from current-carrying wires. Specifically, in 1820, Hans Christian Oersted, who was a Danish physicist, conducted an experiment in which he had a wire with compasses nearby. Now, initially, these compasses would be pointing towards the geographic North Pole of Earth, like they typically do. And what we have here, and I want to make sure we can really see what's going on, is, for instance, this compass here and this one here are actually located, we'll say, underneath the wire, and these three are located above the wire, and additionally, let's say that this compass right here is actually further away above the wire than this one, so it is appears bigger because it's literally just closer to us. So think of this like a 3D image of sorts. And what Orsted noticed was that when he ran a current through the wire, some of these compasses became deflected. So specifically in this situation, we've got current going from down here to up in this direction because current goes from positive to negative. And what do we notice? Well, we see that with these two compasses, they basically seem to be deflected in opposite directions a, a little bit. And this one that's further away is also deflected, though not as much. And then these two compasses over on this side can't really notice any change at all. All right, so then Orsted figured out, okay, what happens if I turn up the current? So he did that. And when he turned up the current, he saw that this deflection of the compasses over here on the right actually got even bigger. And so, for instance, the one underneath is now going totally to the left. This one on top is going totally to the right. And this one's gone a little bit more. But notice we're still not getting an effect on these two. Well, what's something else we could do? Well, let's reverse the direction of the current. And when we reverse the direction of the current, we will see that, oh, now this effect has been switched. Now we have the opposite deflection occurring here. Rather than going to the left, this one's going to the right. Rather than going to the right, this one's going to the left. And this one's also deflected to the left, though, once again, not as much. But we're still seeing no effect here. And notice as a final point, when we turn the current off, this deflection stops, and they all point back to north once again. So what are some various trends that Orsted and other physicists, for that matter, noticed here? So what specifically do we notice? Well, first off, is that the intensity of this deflecting effect is directly proportional to the magnitude of the current. When the current was bigger, the compasses were deflected more. On top of that, we see that the intensity of the effect is inversely proportional to the distance from the wire. The compasses that are closer to the wire get deflected more than the compass that is further away from the wire. So whatever the effect here, current makes it stronger, distance makes it weaker. Well, let's go a little bit further, and we can also say, well, we notice that when we have a compass above and below, we're actually getting opposite deflections on opposite sides of the wire. And taking that a step further, we also got opposite deflections when we reversed the direction of the current. So the current going one way produced a deflection in one direction, we switched the current to deflection went the other way. So that seems to matter. And then lastly, and possibly most curiously, we see that these ones over here, we saw no effect, that the needle didn't move. So specifically, when the wire and the compass needles were perpendicular to each other, we didn't see any effect at all. We saw when it was parallel to the wire, but not when it was perpendicular. Well, what exactly caused this deflection? And we have a pretty good guess because we know what causes compasses to always point to the geographic north pole of Earth. So let's Kind of run through this, though. Static electric charges, so charges that are not moving, they produce electric fields, and those electric fields will affect other electric charges, positive and negative charges. But what we're seeing now is that when we start to cause these charges to flow, when we start to cause them to move, they not only produce electric 
forces. They also start producing magnetic fields and magnetic forces as well. So as soon as an electric charge is moving, it not only produces an electric field, but also a magnetic field. And this actually makes some sense with our previous discussion of magnetism, because remember, we noticed that single atoms behave like magnets. They have magnetic moments, so in other words, they can act like a magnetic dipole in a certain direction. Well, that makes sense, because what happens around an atom? Well, the electrons are moving, so there's a motion of charge there. And in fact, this is actually how we also often think about what is producing the magnetic moment or the magnetic field of an electron. Well, it's that the electron is spinning. Now, I want to be careful here. This spin is really just a conceptualization. It's not actually physically spinning that we can tell. Um, this is really more of a quantum mechanical effect, but we often think about it this way to at least help us try to process this. So static charges, electric fields only, moving charges, electric and magnetic fields. So these compasses were deflected because the current in the wire was generating a magnetic field, that flow of charge. So let's first talk about well, how what controls the magnitude or the intensity of the magnetic field, which in turn would control the magnitude or intensity of the deflection. More magnetic field, the compasses are deflected more. And the equation we have for that is b is equal to mu naught i over 2 pi r, where b is the magnetic field intensity, which we measure in Tesla with a capital T. Mu naught is a constant that we know as the vacuum permeability. i is the current in the wire in amps, and r is the distance from the wire in meters. Now, a couple things here. We see that this fits with what was observed, that if we increase the current in the wire, if we cause those charges to flow faster, the magnetic field increases. And additionally, we see that if we move further away from the wire, the magnetic field decreases. One other point I want to bring up is that I called this magnetic field intensity. That's a little bit of a misnomer. There's multiple ways to uh, basically categorize how strong a magnetic field is. One's called the B field, one's called the H field. We don't need to worry about that. But right now, just think about B as the magnetic field intensity. That is what that stands for. Now, one last thing we should mention is well, what about this vacuum permeability? Well, that is mu naught. It is a constant, and the number is 1.26 times 10 to the minus 6 teslas times meters over amps. And we see that with this, if I stick this constant in here, the amps will cancel, the mirrors will cancel, I'm left with Teslas. The more classical way of writing this is 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7 Teslas times meters over amps. Either way is okay. Now, but what is this vacuum permeability? Well, it's a lot like epsilon naught that we saw with electric forces, which was the vacuum permittivity. So the vacuum permeability is a fundamental constant of nature. It is something that, as far as we can tell, is just kind of encoded into reality. And it's the capability of a vacuum to be permeated by a magnetic field, just like the electric permittivity was the ability of a vacuum to be permeated by an electric field. Similar concept here. And additionally, it's gone by a bunch of different names. Apparently, it's becoming a little more in vogue to call it just the magnetic constant, which makes sense. Um, but you're going to almost always see it as vacuum permeability or the permeability of free space. Those terms are very, very old, but they've basically passed the test of time. But what about the direction of the magnetic field from a current carrying wire? Well, the magnetic field produced is actually going to be basically a series of concentric circles around this wire, where it's going to be more intense closer to the wire, it's going to be weaker as we get further and further out. And these circles explain a couple of things. One, it explains why compasses on one side of the wire saw a different effect from compasses on the other side of the wire. But another effect is, let's say you had a compass right here that was pointed perpendicular to the current carrying wire, why we saw no effect, because it was already pointed perpendicularly. So it was not going to see any subsequent effect to happen. Okay, now, the thing is, this is kind of a 3D drawing, and we can see that these magnetic field lines go in concentric circles around it, and oftentimes this is kind of difficult to draw, so we often will draw this in a very 2D way, like so. And what we have on this side are a bunch of dots, and we have on this side are a bunch of X's, and what do those stand for? Well, the dots are telling us that the magnetic field on that side is coming out of the page towards us, and that the X's are going in the page away from us. Magnetic fields, and really a lot of this unit, is very three-dimensional, so we do a lot of these shorthands to make the drawings a little easier. So if I look on the drawing on the left, these field lines are coming away from the back of the wire 
towards us, so they are going to be drawn as dots. And then when they pass us, they're going to be going into the page on this right-hand side, so we get these X's. But what determines whether these magnetic field lines go this direction or the other direction? The direction of the magnetic field produced from a current carrying wire is actually defined by something known as the right-hand rule. This is how we can know if we're doing it correctly. Okay, so how exactly do we do this? Well, we look at the current carrying wire we have here, which in this example is pointed upward, and we have to use our right hand. Now, okay, big important point. If you can't distinguish your right from your left, you're going to have to figure it out this unit. So you're going to have your right hand, you're going to take your thumb and point it upward in the direction of the current, and then you're going to take your fingers on that hand and pretend like you're wrapping them around the wire. So the wire is going up this way, and we are wrapping it around the wire, and we can see that that will help us define the direction of the magnetic field. So if I do that, the magnetic field, if I was to look at it from the top, the magnetic field would be going in the counterclockwise direction. So if I was going to look at this picture from the top, it would have the magnetic field in the going the counterclockwise direction, or in other words, going out of the page on this side into the page on that side. It is not hard to do, but it does take some practice until you get used to doing it and then it's going to be pretty much second nature. So let's actually try it out and see if we can do this properly. And this is actually, once again, because 3D pictures are often hard to draw, this is actually two current carrying wires. And what we see is that for the one on the left that looks like a dot, that's telling us the current is coming out of the page. And on the one on the right, it looks like an X, that's the current going into the page. If you're not sure if you can remember if it's going out or into, think of it like an arrow. If you see an arrow from the front, it looks like a point. If you see an arrow from the back, the feathers are going to kind of look like an X. That's a way to distinguish between the two. So, looking at these, let's first look at the one on the left. And if we look at the one on the left, well, the current is going out of the page. So it's going to be going towards you, towards your body. So we're going to take our thumb and have to go towards our body. We're going to take our fingers and we're going to curl it around. And we should be seeing that the magnetic field, from my perspective, should be going in the counterclockwise direction. And now let's look at the other one. Well, the other one that's going into the page, I'm going to take my thumb and point it into the page. And I'm going to take my fingers and curl them around. And we see that that's going to say that the magnetic field should be going in the clockwise direction. So let's do a brief example. Let's determine the magnetic field from these two wires, the 10 amp wire and the 8 amp wire, at point P, which is located 5 centimeters from both wires. Okay, well, how do we go about doing this? Well, first, we need to, before we do anything else, determine the magnetic field from one wire and determine the magnetic field from the other wire. So let's do the magnitudes of these magnetic fields first. So I'm going to use B is equal to mu naught I over 2 pi R for both wires. And I'm going to stick in my numbers. Mu naught is a constant. 2 pi is a constant. This one, the current is going to be 10 amps. This one, 8 amps. The distance is 0.05 meters, because it's 5 centimeters for both wires. And we get that the magnetic field strength at point P from the 10 amp wire is 4.01 times 10 to the minus 5 tesla. And from the 8 amp wire, it is 3.21 times 10 to the minus 5 tesla. Okay, so we've got the magnitudes of each separate field but these fields are vectors. So are they going to combine and are we going to add these values together or are they going to actually start to cancel each other out and we need to subtract them from each other? Well, to determine that, now we need to figure out, okay, what is the direction of the magnetic field from both wires? And we just did one exactly like this, but make sure we remember the 10 amp one is coming out of the page. It's going to go from my perspective and probably your perspective uh, counterclockwise. The 8 amp one is going to go into the page and clockwise. And so we go ahead and draw those out. And what we see is that the magnetic field in the center from both of them is going upwards. And since it's going upwards together, they are going to combine at point P. So the magnetic field from the two wires, we're just going to combine the two vectors together. And we're going to get that it is 4.01 times 10 to the minus 5 plus 3.21 times 10 to the minus 5 and get a total of 7.22 times 10 to the minus 5 teslas directed specifically upward. We define our directions as left, right, up, down, into the page, out of the page. That's the easiest way we can distinguish all six uh, specific directions. Well, let's look at this picture once again. And okay, so once again, we have a wire coming out of the page and into the page and there are two magnetic fields. But what if this was actually the same wire. What if this wire was going out of the page on the left and then into the page on the right and actually made a loop? 
of wire. So let me go ahead and draw that loop. And when we get that loop drawn, we see that, okay, the current on our end would be going to the right, the current away from us would be going to the left, but we're getting this generation here. And what we're noticing is that inside this loop of wire, all of the magnetic field is actually going in the same direction. But so what this tells us is that inside the loop, we're getting all the field pointing in the same direction, and it's going to be stronger because it's very, very concentrated. Every part of that loop is fairly close to the center, all going upward. Now, if we look at the outside, it's all going downward, but the issue is, is that it's going to be weaker because it's further away from other pieces of the wire. And in fact, this is the basis for a very, very useful device, which is often known as a solenoid. So a solenoid is not just one loop, it is a series of loops all collapsed in on top of each other. So we can see here that the current is coming from the bottom, going up through all these loops to the top. And what's going to happen is when we do this, we're actually going to get a magnetic field produced. So we're inside it's all going in one direction, on the outside it's all going the other way. And if we want to double check that, that we're doing it right, I'm going to take my thumb in the right hand direction. I'm going to basically have it go around this way, one of the loops. And I see on the inside it's going upward, on the outside it's going downward. But all these fields will combine together from all these loops to make a bigger magnetic field. And in fact, this is very, very similar. In fact, it looks almost indistinguishable from that which we get from a bar magnet. We usually don't draw the field lines inside the bar magnet, but this is actually how these loops occur. So we're actually getting a north pole and a south pole in this solenoid. And the reason why we're getting that is this is actually an electromagnet. A magnet where the magnetic field is produced solely by an electric current. There is nothing magnetic in here. There's no permanent magnet in this space. And in fact, this is how most magnets that we have in the world work. Not ones on your refrigerator, but if there's any sort of engineering application where they need to have a large magnet of some sorts, more often than not, it's produced by coils of electric wire causing that part inside the coils to have the magnetic field all go in the same direction. Now, a couple things here. Uh, how do we make this electromagnet stronger? Well, we could increase the current, because if we increase the current, that's going to increase the magnetic field. We can increase the loops, or what are often called the turns of the solenoids. If you have more loops, you're going to have more pieces generating this magnetic field. And additionally, we can also insert a ferromagnetic core. So in other words, I could take a piece of like iron or nickel, like a rod, and stick it inside the solenoid, and the magnetic field from the solenoid would actually get boosted by that ferromagnetic core, making it stronger. But, I want to make it very, very clear, that core is not necessary. You can have an electromagnet without having any permanent magnet in it whatsoever. So what are the takeaways we now have for magnetic fields from currents? Well, first, can we conceptually distinguish fields produced by static and moving electric charges? If it's a static charge, it is only producing an electric field. If it's moving, it's producing both an electric field and a magnetic field. Can we calculate the magnetic field produced by a wire or multiple wires at a particular position in space? And can we utilize the right-hand rule to determine the direction of the magnetic field produced by either a wire or even by a loop of wire and either inside the loop or outside the loop.